Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Seth Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Bloombro Commander spoilers. So we are on to pre-con number three, and this pre-con is pretty sweet. It's all about squirrels, and it's all about food, and there's a lot of really exciting cards to talk about, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking sweet new Bloombro cards. Before we do, a couple of quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can snag them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest previews throughout the day, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. And third, if you want to see the full deck list, including all the reprints and all that stuff, I'm going to link it in the description, so check it out there. Anyway, let's talk some more Bloomborough Commander. So the face commander of our Squirrel Away deck is Hazel of the Root Bloom. So it's a 4 mana 3 5 legendary Squirrel Druid. You can tap it and pay 2 life, and tap X untap tokens you control to make X mana of any combination of colors. And at the beginning of your end step, you create a token that's a copy of target token you control, but if the token's a Squirrel, you get 2 copies of it instead. So Hazel kind of shows off what this deck is all about, which is making a bunch of Squirrels, making a bunch of tokens, it also has a food sub theme. And I think the most interesting part of this deck to me is squirrels are a pretty iconic creature type. They have this big cult following, but there's really only one proper squirrel commander in Chatterfing Squirrel General. So now we have another one in Hazel, and I think that Hazel is on par with Shatterfang. They're different. Shatterfang is kind of a combo-y squirrel commander. Hazel is more of like a rampy squirrel commander, but it can make a ridiculous amount of mana, and copying your token's pretty cool. We also have a backup commander joining the mix in the Old Acorn Gang. And the Old Acorn Gang is a super scary card. It's a 5 mana 5 5 legendary squirrel warrior. It has menace and reach and trample, and it says squirrels you control have cap target squirrel you control gets plus 2 plus 2 gains trample and blend turn activate this only as a sorcery and whenever one or more squirrels you control deal combat damage to a player draw a card so the thing i like about our three squirrel commanders now is they all kind of work together they all want you to go wide with squirrels but they all do it in their own way and they all kind of have a twist hazel's like the rampy version of your go wide squirrel commander chatterfang's like the combo version of your go wide squirrel commander and then the old acorn gang is the voltron version you want to make a bunch of squirrels and then tap them all to pump your old acorn gang in one shot someone with commander damage so you can play them all together or if you have a squirrel deck you can kind of make a few tweaks and like switch your commanders in and out which i really really like so i think the old acorn gang is a really frightening card we've never seen an ability exactly like its ability just giving all your squirrels the ability to tap and pump something plus two plus two and give a trample in the end of turn it's kind of like grassland crusader which was an old six drop for a two four that did this one time old acorn gain gives all of your squirrels that ability and squirrels are so good at going wide it's pretty realistic that you can just make a big board full of squirrels and then one shot kill someone especially since it also gives trample which is kind of ridiculous if you want to be mean you could throw some infect <laughs> into your deck and uh put a grafted exoskeleton or something on a squirrel and just very easily one shot people and then the last ability i want to point it out it's not a toski uh, because it says one or more squirrels you only can at the most draw three cards a turn cycle with the old acorn game toski just draws for each creature that deals combat damage the old acorn gang essentially draws for each of your opponents that took combat damage by a squirrel so as long as at least one squirrel hits each of your opponents you draw three cards each turn cycle which is still very powerful but it's not quite the busted level of card draw as toski so the old acorn gang it just works really well with squirrels. Squirrels are just so good at going wide. With Squirrel Nest in Deep Forest Hermit and Squirrel Wrangler, that it seems pretty easy to just like make a bunch of one ones and then just start smashing people to death Voltron style with the old acorn game. Also works really well with haste, or in the case of the old acorn game, you don't even need literal haste. Thousand year elixir gets the job done. You really just need to be able to activate the abilities of your creatures with haste because you don't really care so much about giving the old acorn gang haste, but what you really want is all the squirrel tokens that you're making making to be able to tap right away to be pumping things right away so i think thousand year legs are going to be one of the most important cards in old acorn gang deck so i think old acorn gang 
very scary squirrel commander. I would say it probably ranks below Chatterfang as far as just like how strong it is as a combo commander, but it is really fun. And like I said before, I think you just jam them all together in the same deck. We also got one of the most ridiculous cards from all the pre con so far in Hazel's Brewmaster. It's a four minute three four squirrel warlock with menace. It says when it enters or attacks, X up to one target creature from a graveyard and create a food token. And then the big one, food you control have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Hazel's Brewmaster. So Hazel's Brewmaster is like a ridiculous combo card. It calls back to cards like Necrotic Use and Agatha Soul Calder. And we've seen these cards be absurd combo engines. And in some ways, Hazel's Brewmaster is even better because the thing that it's giving the activated abilities to is a food token. So it's most commonly going to be a non-creature artifact, which opens up even more combos and makes it harder to disrupt. So what are we actually doing with Hazel's Brewmaster? Well, easy mode is you can just play this card super fairly and you get a bunch of food on the battlefield. Food are super easy to make. So you make a bunch of food and then you exile a land of war elves and now all of your food tap for a green mana or you exile an archivist and now all your food tap to draw a card or maybe you exile an avatar of woe and all your food tap to blow up a creature. It can't be regenerated. So that's kind of like the super fair way is just exile whatever the best activated ability is in the graveyard and use all of your food as if they had that ability. But if you want to actually come Combo. Easiest combo, Devoted Druid, or Cinder Haze Wretch, which is not as game ending, but still does the same thing. So the trick here, Devoted Druid, is this two mana zero two that taps to make a green mana, and you can put a negative one, negative one counter on it to untap it. So normally Devoted Druid can untap a couple of times, but then it would kill itself because it has too many negative one, negative one counters. The trick here is food aren't creatures. So food can have an infinite number of negative one, negative one counters on it, and it doesn't actually matter. So if you exile a devoted druid to a Hazel's Brewmaster, you can tap a food to make a green mana and then just untap it. You put a negative one, negative one counter on it, but it doesn't matter. So then you tap it again for a green mana. So essentially this makes infinite green mana. If you replace devoted druid with Cinder Haze Wretch, you just get to make all of your opponents discard all of their cards and they're gonna be very, very salty because they can't do anything for the rest of the game. And then if your opponent manages to draw cards, you just do it again and make them discard that card. So very, very brutal combos plus there's so many other combos like being able to give activated abilities to creatures or in this case non-creatures which is even scarier that don't normally have those abilities is just asking to break the game so like pilly pala you can pay two mana to untap it megas of the coffers you can pay to untap it to make a black for each swamp you control so you make a bunch of swamps you tap for like 10 mana untap for two infinite mana there's so many ways that this card goes infinite it goes infinite with a hand sandwich as people like to say the only thing i would say about this card is keep in mind that your food having the activated abilities are tied to Hazel being on the battlefield. So if your opponent can kill the Hazel, then you're not making infinite mana with your devoted druid food or whatever. But I think that Hazel is just very good in any food style deck. We got like Yagra coming up with Bloomborough, Yom the Master Chef, Shelob, or Asmor, Greta, or Camilla, any of these food commanders. I think you just play this because it makes food with its ETB. It works like weird graveyard hate. And then it's pretty easy to throw in a one or two card combo. It's like a backdoor plan where sometimes you're just accidentally going to go infinite and win the game with Hazel's Brewmaster. The card is actually kind of wild. We also got Insatiable Fugivore. <laughs> A very hungry rat berserker. It is a 4 mana 2 4. It says when it enters, create a food token. Then you may exhale three cards from your graveyard. If you do, repeat that process. And then you can pay for sack X food. Creatures you control get plus X plus zero and gain menace until undeterred. So Insatiable Fugivore is basically a finisher for a food deck. It's similar to like Pippin, Warden of Isengrad or Knight of Sweets Revenge. These cards that are like, if you make a whole bunch of food, you can sack some of these food and I will maybe kill your opponent. I think the Insatiable Fugivore is probably not quite as good as Knights of Sweets Revenge because Knight of Sweets Revenge, you don't actually have to sacrifice all the food. You just sack the Knight of Sweets Revenge. Pippin, you sack four food to give creatures plus three, plus three in haste. Insatiable Fugivore, you can't sack a ton of food, which is nice. If you make a hundred food or something, you make all your creatures over a hundred power and give them menace for just four mana. But I think you, uh, if you're playing a food deck, you probably just stack up these effects and have a bunch of different finishers. So I don't think it's like super strong. I remember I had the Pippin deck when Lord of the Rings came out uh, with the Sam and Frodo 
Komodo deck. It was part of that deck. And that deck made a lot of food, but I ended up cutting Pippin because I didn't feel like sack four foods to get three plus three plus three for my team was actually enough to be worth it. So I imagine that might kind of be where Insatiable Fugivore lands as well. But if you want to pump your team in a food deck, it does get the job done. We also got Gourmand's Talent, a one mana class. This has level one. During your turn, artifacts you control are food in addition to their other types and have the food ability. Pay two, tap, sack it, gain three life. For three mana, you get to level two, which is whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, create a three, three green raccoon creature token. And then for four mana, you get to level three, which is whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So Grumman's Talent is a very weird card. Turning all of your artifacts into food for one mana there's got to be something busted we can do with this. I just haven't figured out exactly what it is. I guess you can eat your Black Lotus, which is kind of funny, but doesn't seem especially powerful. I guess the best I can think of is it allows you to sacrifice your artifacts for value. The only other card that we've seen that kind of does this is Yagra Eater of Days, which just turns all creatures on the battlefield except for itself into food. So the best use that I've come up with is like, you get down Gorman's Talent, your Solemn Simulacrum becomes a two, you want it to die so you can draw a card. So you pay two, tap it, sack it, you draw the card from Solemn, you gain a bit of life, or maybe you sack an Ugin's Nexus, which is now a food, so you can somehow eat an Ugin's Nexus and get an extra turn. There might be way more busted things that I haven't thought of yet. I'm very curious if you've come up with a good way to abuse the fact that all of our artifacts can be food during our turn. Definitely let me know because it's a super unique ability and I just love wacky unique abilities like that. But it's going to take a little bit of brewing and a little bit of work to actually figure out the way to abuse this. The rest of the card, it's essentially a life gain card. It's like a really Book of Exalted Deeds. I think one of the things people miss when they see the once per turn restriction on a card like Gorman's Talent, like level three, when you gain life for the first time each turn, you get a 3 3. That's actually the same as something like Book of Exalted Deeds or things we've seen many times in the past. It affects it trigger once on your end step or on your upkeep it's just a twist on those like the timing slightly different but as far as how they play it's almost exactly the same like if you gain life you get a 3-3 gorman's talent gives it right away book of exalted deeds gonna give it to you on your end step and then the last mode is essentially like archangel of thune but only once each turn i will say probably the best way to abuse these facts is just have like soul sister something that's gonna let you gain life during your opponent's turn because neither level two or no level three says your turn it's easy each turn so if you can be gaining life on your opponent's turn you can actually scale your board very quickly like if you are gaining life during each of your opponent's turn you're gonna make four three threes every time around the table and put a total of four plus one plus one counters on your until your team every time around the table which is actually a lot of power and toughness if you're just doing it once during your turn uh, not very good. Not going to be good enough to be worth it. But if you can gain life during each of your opponent's turn, then Gorman's Talent becomes pretty interesting and some sort of life gain deck. And that does work pretty well with food because food, you can sack during your opponent's turn. So if you make enough food, you sack enough food, you're pumping your team, you're making three threes. So this is a card I think I'm going to add into my Frodo and Sam deck. I think it's worth it in that deck. They're very good at making food. Plus Sam lets you sack your food on the cheap. Could also be worth it in just generic life gain decks like Dina, for example. Lethal, Trellisara, especially if playing all the Soul Warden effects, the Soul Attendant effects, makes it pretty easy to be gaining life every turn, and then Gorbin's talent can really pop off. So, not sure exactly what to do with the first mode of this card, but it's definitely super unique, and I am very excited to brew around it. Next up, we get a big old bat warlock in Moonstone Eulogist. So a five mana four four flyer it says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, you get to make a blood token. Bats gotta gotta drink the blood. That's what bats do, I guess. And then whenever you sack an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on it, and you gain a life. So Moonstone Eulogist reminds me a little bit of like a safe Corvald, maybe a safe Marikel Cruel Death Priest. It's one of these big five drop flyers that grows as things are sacrificed. The twist on Moonstone Eulogist is kind of twofold. So for one, whenever your opponent's creatures die, you get a blood and then you can sack those blood for one mana to rummage and also add a counter to the Eulogist and draw a card. So that's nice. It does kind of fuel itself as things die. Although we are gonna have to most likely spend some mana to sack the blood unless you got some way to get around that. The downside of Moonstone Eulogist is unlike Corvald, 
called Ur Mazarek. It only cares about artifacts being sacrificed. Like Korvald, anytime you sacrifice anything, it's gonna grow and draw you a card. Mazarek, whenever anyone sacrifices a permanent, it's gonna grow and put a counter on each creature you control. So compared to the other options that kind of exist, I feel like Moonstone Eulogist is kind of on the lower powered end. So this card, it does work well, if you're sacking a bunch of food. And I think that's the goal of this, is you play it in the pre-con, and then you like make a bunch of food and sack them to Insatiable Fugivore, and your Moonstone Eulogist gains a bunch of life and gets really big. But outside of the pre-con itself, I guess it could be sweet in some sort of like dedicated artifact sack deck. I think the plan of making bloods and sacking bloods is probably gonna be too slow for this card to really matter. But maybe you're playing a Caraclan Ironworks deck and you're just looping artifacts and sacking artifacts. This thing's gonna get super big and gain a ton of life. Or maybe you're a Brea deck that's about sacking artifacts or Mishra deck that's about sacrificing artifacts. So I think there are potential homes for this, but this is one of those cards that doesn't really jump off the page at me. I think it's more like a filler level card than an all-star in the decks that you would play it in. We also got a super simple one in Swarm Yard Massacre, a five mana sorcery that says create two one one green squirrel tokens. And then each creature that is an insect, a rat, a spider, or a squirrel gets negative one, negative one until end of turn for each creature you control that is an insect, rat, spider, or squirrel. So Swarm Yard Massacre, I really like cards like this. This is essentially an acorn harvest i guess you get a couple squirrels but it's like a crux of fate and one of the things that wizards has been doing more and more that i really like is they're making wraths that are customizable based on your deck a card like swarm yard massacre most decks would not play this period but if you're a squirrel deck or an insect deck or a spider deck this is going to be a really good card in your deck it reminds me kind of of crux of fate where crux of fate is a bad wrath unless you're a dragon deck then it becomes a one-sided wrath where you get to keep all your creatures and blow up the rest of your opponent's creatures and i really like grass like this because they help speed up the game one of the problems with toxic deluge or damnation or farewell if i'm allowed to say that is like they just slow down the game everyone's stuff gets wrath away the game kind of resets everyone's got to build back up for a few turns a card like swarm yard massacre doesn't really do that if you're playing a squirrel deck you wipe out your opponent's stuff you keep your board you get to get in a bunch of damage and it actually helps close out the game so i think this is a card that if you're playing the creature types that it mentions because you're a rat deck or a spider deck or a squirrel deck I think you play this pretty much every time and it's probably going to be really good. It is true. There will be some situations where you don't have enough squirrels to wrath literally everything. But when you add in the upside of it being essentially one sided, since it's not going to be hurting your board, I think it's still very worth it. Not that you shouldn't play a toxic deluge two or something, but I think in the decks that care about these creature types, the card is just a very easy inclusion. We also got scurry of squirrels which is a very weird card. So it is a three mana two two with Myriad and also Myriad. If you don't know Myriad, when it attacks for each opponent, other than the person you're attacking, you get to make a tapped and attacking token copy of the creature that's going to go away at the end of combat. And then it says, when it deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So Scurry of Squirrels, it's a three mana two two, but if you attack one of your opponents, you're gonna get two copies that are attacking each of your other opponents. So essentially it's a three mana two two that technically attacks for 10 damage. And then it puts aside a bunch of counters on your stuff that stick around. So Scurry of Squirrels, it adds a lot of power and toughness to the battlefield. That's what I've tried to say. It makes a lot of power and toughness. Does that actually matter? The thing that I don't like about this card is it's not especially synergistic with our squirrel commanders. Like Hazel wants a bunch of untapped tokens that you can use for mana, but the myriad tokens are gonna be tapped. Old Acorn Gang wants a bunch of untapped squirrels that you can tap to pump other squirrels and give trample, but all the myriad tokens are gonna be tapped. I guess it kind of works with Chatterfang. You make the myriad tokens and then you'll get a bonus uh, squirrel token with Chatterfang and then you could sack them. So that's probably the best use of it is like, squirry of squirrels you attack you get in some damage you get some counters and then before you have to exile all the tokens you sack them to chatterfang to kill something so i do see uses in chatterfang but outside of that yeah i think it's okay uh, for me i don't really like commander cards that just deal a lot of damage like if that's kind of your whole gimmick is just like i'm a three drop but i can attack for 10 eh, that doesn't really impress me i want to be doing something cooler than that in commander we also got a new squirrely equipment in sword of the 
Squeak. A two-man equipment. This is an equipped creature. Gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control with base power and toughness of one. And then whenever a hamster, mouse, rat, or squirrel you control enters, you may attach Sword of the Squeak to that creature. So, oddly, this would be really good in the Jeskai deck that we talked about before, where the whole gimmick is, like, your creatures being base power and toughness of one. So there's a little inter-precon synergy going on here. But Sword of the Squeak... I think this card is just okay. When you consider that Horn of Valhalla exists, and yes, it's a white card, so you can't play in every deck, but Horn of Valhalla gives a quick creature plus one, plus one for each creature you control for two mana, and it equips for only one more mana, and it can make a bunch of one ones. So of this week looks kind of safe to me, but I guess if you're a deck that wants an equipment, and you can make a lot of one ones, like you're a Cadria Caller of the small deck, or maybe a Chatter Fang deck, where you're just gonna have a ton of these one ones on the battlefield, I could see playing it, especially if you have some extra equipment synergies, where this can be a card that, if you're built around what it's trying to do, it can force through a ton of damage, plus being able to repeatedly free equip is actually nice. That's a big upside of this. This isn't when the sword enters the battlefield, you equip it to free to a hamster, mouse, rat, or squirrel. It's whenever a hamster, mouse, rat, or squirrel enters, you can attach it to it. So let's say you play a squirrel and you get the sword on it and you smash someone and then it dies. The next time you play a squirrel or a hamster, mouse, or rat, then you just put it on again for free. So that is a nice little bonus. So sort of the squeak, it's pretty efficient. It's good at what it does. Horn of Valhalla hasn't really broken anything. So I don't think this is going to break anything, but it is a pretty cute design. And sort of the squeak is just... <laughs> It's a really good punny name. We also got Rootcast Apprenticeship, a four mana green sorcery that says, choose three, and you may choose the same mode more than once. But where's the pause? I don't understand how any of this works. If there's no pause, none of this makes sense. How do I know what modes to choose and how many I can choose? But, uh,. <laughs> Pause aside, the modes are, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature, create a token that's a copy of target token you control, target player creates a 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature token, or target opponent sacks a non-token artifact. So Rootcaster Apprenticeship is kind of interesting. I would say that on this card, there's really one mode that super excites me, and that's the being able to create a token that's a copy of target token. And it's going to take some work to actually make that ability effective. If you're just copying a 1-1 one, one green squirrel or something, or a treasure token, not very good. But if you can make a token copy of something that's really good with like a lithoform engine or something, and then use this to copy it three times, that can actually be kind of busted. I don't know if your typical deck is gonna be able to do that. It takes a lot of work to like write a replication something to get a token copy of it, and then Rootcaster's Apprenticeship to make even more token copies of it. But if you pull it off, it's gonna be sweet. In a generic sense though, mode one, Put two counters on something. You could choose it three times, up to six counters on something for four mana. That's fine. You make a pretty big voltron -y threat. Uh, the token mode we already talked about. Create a 1-1 one -one green squirrel token. So you could choose it three times and make a total of three 1-1s. One a little bit overcosted for four mana. And then target opponent sacks a non-token artifact. I do like that it's non-token, so you're not just going to get a blood or a treasure or a clue. Uh, but it is only one opponent. It's not each opponent, which does kind of power it down a little bit for Commander. So Rootcraster's Apprenticeship, I think it all comes down to that second mode. Like, in a squirrel deck, it's probably fine for value, where if you're playing squirrels, maybe it's just fine to make three one ones, and that's good enough, since you just need good squirrels in your deck, and there's only so many good squirrels in Magic, and squirrels are very synergistic with tokens. Remember, if you're playing squirrels, you have the old Acorn Gang, and you want to tap these squirrels to pump your team and kill your opponent, or you have Chatterfang, so your tokens are making extra squirrels, or they're making mana with Hazel. So in the context of squirrels, I think it's really good. Outside of squirrels, like I said, you really got to be a deck that can make token copies of exciting things and then use this to make more token copies of that thing. Hard to pull off, but when it happens, it's going to be super sweet. So those are the new cards. As far as reprints, <laughs> we get Garrick Chris Huntsman as a, a squirrel? A badger? I don't even know what animal that is, but some sort of imagined critters version of Garrick. Then we get just some cute reprint art, second harvest, saw in half. I gotta say, 
When it comes to choosing versions of cards, I'm pretty sure Bloomborough is going to win out in a lot of these. Because that second harvest, for example, or the saw in half, or the squirrels chopping a snake in half, it's just like the art is so incredibly amazing. So just huge shout out to Wizards for just nailing it again and again and again with art in this set. Value-wise, the squirrel deck is actually the best pre-con we've talked about so far by quite a bit. Chatterfang, over $10. Belladros, over $10. Toski, over $10. Saw in half, around $10. And then Second Harvest, Masswood Nexus, Skull Clamp, all like $5 to $7. So the reprint value, even disregarding the cool new art and all the new cards, is actually very, very high. So if you're just looking at this deck financially, Squirrels is the best deck so far. We still got one more to go, though. But anyway, that brings us to the end of the Squirrel deck from Bloomboro. Let me know what you think about all these cards in the comments, and I'll be back. We got one more deck to go. I'll be back to break that one down in a little bit. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoy it, and I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? We can check out the last couple spoiler videos right over here.